People often ask me what this thing was that made Margot Fontaine this great star. It's like trying to explain genius. She had wonderful expressive eyes, wonderful expressive arms, a godlike physique. I mean, her proportions were miraculous, and all this is added up to a great ballerina. One just loved her from the moment she came on stage till the moment of her last curtain call. It was the impact of Fontaine as a dancer, as an actress, and as a person that moved us and excited us. But she had everything. A lady, a ballerina of great, great experience. She shaped my career. There was a chemistry, something worked. Now that I don't dance anymore, I live here with my husband on this farm in Panama. When I was dancing, my career was certainly very long. It was 45 years as a professional dancer from shortly before my 15th birthday. But to go right back to the very beginning, the first house that I can remember was in the London suburb of Ealing. And there we were a happy, ordinary little family of four with my father and mother and my brother Felix, three years older than me. Nobody can remember why it was suddenly decided when I was about four and a half that I should go to dancing class. But uh, for whatever the reason, I can well remember still the morning when my mother and I went out of our little front gate. And instead of turning to the left and down the hill towards the shops with me hop skipping along beside her as we usually did we turned to the right and then to the right again and after a very short distance we came to a house went up to the front door and there it said Miss Grace Basusto teacher of dancing it couldn't have been a better choice because she was really the ideal children's teacher always uh, pleasant, encouraging, patient, and a very, very good teacher. So that was my first great piece of luck in my ballet career. Anyway, Miss Basasto accepted me as her pupil, and my mother bought my first pair of dancing shoes. Now, surprisingly enough, I happen to have them right here, and um, I find them rather sweet. I just don't know why it was that my mother kept one of these little slippers, and Miss Basasto kept the other until when she died, they, it came back to us. 
And here they are, my first dancing shoes. Yeah, I must have been, I suppose, six, about six, when one day my mother took me up to London to a matinee performance of the greatest dancer in the world, Anna Pavlova, and she was dancing the fairy doll. <laughs> Well, I'm ashamed to admit that instead of being bowled over by Anna Pavlova and filled with ambition to be just like her, at the great age of six, with a few dancing lessons behind me, I thought that I could do pretty well too, and especially in my favorite dance, the Irish washerwoman's jig. I was eight when this happy family existence came to an end because my father accepted a position with the British American Tobacco Company to be a chief engineer for their whole China division overseeing all their factories there. And for a variety of reasons, things that happened later on, we were in fact never again to live together as a family of four. It was on the 5th of November in 1927 that we sailed from Liverpool across the Atlantic for New York. And America was so incredibly different to England. There were these skyscrapers in New York, the traffic on driving on the other side of the road. Finally, we arrived at Shanghai and the ship moored up in midstream of the Wangpu River opposite the famous Shanghai waterfront, the Bund. That must have been early, probably about May in 1928. And even now, the Bund is almost unchanged. Life in Shanghai was tremendously exciting and different. For one thing, there was a bustle of streets with people everywhere and little shops with strange things in them. And then there were the rickshaws in those days. One went everywhere by rickshaw, pulled by coolies, no bicycles then. But what my mother had always loved was taking me to dancing class. So, of course, she very quickly was looking for another dancing teacher. And she found this English teacher called Audrey King. I remember when Margot's mother brought Margot to me. I think she was about eight or nine. She was a very shy little girl. And she worked very hard all the time. Her potential, I thought, was good, at least because she always could take a perfect fifth position from the very first lesson. She had lovely straight legs and a beautiful arabesque line from the very beginning. And she was different from the other little girls in the class who were obviously only learning dancing because Mother thought it would do them good and just for fun. My formal education took place in the Cathedral School for Girls, the most British institution you could possibly imagine. And now it's a school for the performing arts. This was once the beautifully manicured playing field. And here is the staircase that used to lead up to the office of our real dragon of a headmistress, Miss Fleet. She terrified the pupils and the parents alike. The oak woodwork is still here, and the classrooms, just as I remember them. Here was the assembly hall, which to my surprise is now a ballet studio with bars and a mirror. fair at school, but quite hopeless at games. I hated games. I loved swimming, and I really enjoyed dancing, but it wasn't that important, but I did enjoy it. 
I went to various teachers and they all seemed to think that I had talent. Well, my mother more cautiously thought, big fish in a small pond, that's not so difficult. To have a real assessment, she would have to take me to London. So I was 14 and it was decided I should leave school. I'll never forget that last day of term, I went to say goodbye to the dragon, Miss Fleet. And suddenly I wasn't frightened of her anymore. I went up to her office and said, well, I'm leaving, I've come to say goodbye. And she was very nice. She, of course, she took a very dim view of me leaving school at that age. Uh, but in a gentle way, she said, you know, you'll regret this all your life because you'll find yourself an ignoramus among other people. And indeed, very often I have. Early in 1934, my mother and I arrived in London and she brought me to the pheasantry in the King's Road, Chelsea, where the Princess Seraphine Astafieva, a famous ballerina from the Imperial Russia, had her dancing school. And she was, oh, the most wonderful teacher. I just loved her. Previously, I, had, I really didn't like ballet dancing very much because it was rather stiff and rigid and, frankly, boring. And I liked something where I was banging a tambourine and stamping about in heeled shoes. I loved that kind of thing, rhythm and movement and everything. But with the Princess Astafieva, she brought all this uh, excitement, movement, music to ballet, and she made all the steps seem very easy. She was a wonderful teacher. But with the typical egoism of youth, I didn't stop to think of my mother's special problem, which was, should she stay with me in London and try to advance me with my dancing. Or if I really wasn't worth it and didn't have any talent, we would go back to Shanghai and continue our life there. So my mother felt, well, she's fine in a dancing school, but she has to get a real assessment. And she took me to audition at the Sadler's Wells Theatre. That was the school for the then Vic Wells Ballet, a young company, which much later became Britain's Royal Ballet. And it's founder and inspired director for many years was Ninette de Valois, the presiding genius of British Ballet. It must be just on 60 years ago that I was sitting in this room watching a class of very young students. My eye roved around the room and suddenly was arrested by a little girl. I turned to the teacher and I said, who is the little girl on the left? She told me who she was. Peggy Houghton, as they called her in those days, known to us all today as Margaret Fontaine. She was an extremely gay, happy little girl, not at all engrossed in being a great ballerina. In fact, her ambition was to tap dance and be a character dancer. And this ambition, to my horror, was encouraged by the mother until I tried to explain to her that something quite out of the ordinary, had entered the ranks of the Sadler's Wells Children's School, and she was no character dancer, no tap dancer, but a coming great ballerina. Her encounter with Frederick Ashton at the beginning was also rather amusing. I had told him about her. He looked at her. He said he wasn't quite sure. Then they got together in a little dance he was arranging for four girls. And after it was over, Margaret went back for lunch to her mother, and she said to her mother, I don't understand that man's choreography. But time very quickly cured all those small differences. From then on, they became an inspiration for each other. It's lovely to think it all happened here at the very beginning of the Sadler's Wells Ballet. The Bézette La Fée was the first completely new ballet that I ever danced, and the solo that Frederick Ashton arranged for me has always remained in my memory, although the rest of the ballet is long since forgotten. Recently, I taught that dance to Nicola Catrack, and she is dancing on the very same stage on which it was first performed in 1935. I was 16 at the time. How lucky I was that so many of the ballets were choreographed by that genius, Frederick Ashton. Uh, 
I suppose the first time that I ever came in contact with Margot Fontaine must have been in 1933 or 34. And it was during a rehearsal of a ballet that I'd just done for Sadler's Wells of Le Rendezvous, and I think she was replacing somebody. And anyway, I found her, yeah, I didn't sort of get on with her, and I found her inadequate in what she was doing. And also, she seemed to me to have a sort of superior attitude, which didn't appeal to me, and, and also sort of, I sensed a kind of streak of stubbornness. And um, so there, I mean, anyway, the, the rehearsal finished, and the next time I worked with her seriously was in, you know, in the part of the bride in Bézard La Fère where there again she had a very difficult variation to do, which required a tremendous attack and, and sharpness in her dancing, which Margaret at that time didn't have. She was rather sort of, as I used to say to you, your feet are rather buttery. I mean, instead of too soft, they didn't have that edge in them. But, and so I, I bullied and bullied and bullied her, and she got more into, into a state, and then finally she burst into tears and rushed up and put her arms around me and said, I'm sorry, but I'm trying my very best and I can't do any more. So then I realized that she'd really conceded to me and that from then on we would be able to work together, which indeed we did very happily. When I look back, those were wonderful years in the 30s at Saddles Wells Theatre. It wasn't long after I joined that uh, the prima ballerina, Alicia Markova, left the company and that gave tremendous opportunities to us, more junior dancers. Then we had this uh, really superb musical director, Constant Lambert, and the principal dancer was Robert Helpman, who was a man of the theatre, if ever there was. I mean, if he was on the stage, nobody was going to look at me, frankly, and so this was the best training I could possibly have had to become a real artist of the ballet, not just a dancer. This amateur film of Giselle, in which I'm dancing with Robert Helpman, was taken during a performance at Saddles Wells Theatre in 1937. as a artist.
partnership was perhaps one of the most extraordinary experiences in my life because I danced with Fontaine for 25 years. And I don't suppose for the first nine or ten of those years, I ever spoke to her at all outside the rehearsal room or the dressing room. I'd say good night, what time's the rehearsal in the morning, but I never spoke to her. I think it was because I thought she was standoffish. And she thought that I was standoffish. And we never bothered to inquire whether we were standoffish or not. And then I remember very clearly one day walking down the street. And I looked at her and said something. And she laughed. And I remember thinking, my goodness, she's a friend, a great, intimate, close friend. And this is how it remained for the rest of our association. Our little company used to dance every year in May in the university town of Cambridge, which coincided with the undergraduates' final examinations. But in spite of that, they somehow managed to entertain us in an almost continuous floating party which moved from one location to another, but never seemed to quite die down for the whole week. It was in Cambridge in 1937 that I fell suddenly and instantly in love. And it happened in that room up there, which was the living room of the digs that I was sharing with my closest friends in the ballet, Pamela May and June Bray. One evening, I returned to find that the party had settled temporarily in our rooms. There were quite a few people there already, and the lights were very dim. And in the middle of the room, two dark-haired young men were dancing. They were dancing the rumba, which at that time was practically unknown in England. I was fascinated by the younger of the two men. And in fact, I watched him for the whole of the rest of the evening. The next morning, something happened that was really very strange indeed. I've never quite been able to explain it. I got out of bed, and I walked across the room, but somehow my feet didn't seem to touch the ground. So I went back and I sat on the edge of the bed to think about it. And suddenly I remembered this dark-haired young man dancing the rumba. I found out that his name was Tito. This is a snapshot of Tito that was taken just across the river there on the grass of the bank. I carried that with me everywhere for years. I can remember walking with him here by the banks of the river and punting. But somehow we were always with a group of people. We weren't really alone very much. He did manage to tell me that his father was the president of Panama. And sometimes he would tell me a little bit about his life in his own country. We met each summer the two following years until 1939 when he had already graduated from Cambridge. And World War II broke out that year in September, and I didn't see Tito again for 14 years. The ballet continued to dance in Cambridge, but without Tito, the place had lost its magic for me. When the war broke out, the government closed all theatres immediately and the company was disbanded, nobody knowing what to expect. Well, after two weeks, the ballet was recalled to dance for the troops in army camps around the country without the usual orchestra that we were accustomed to, but with two pianos as accompaniment. Not surprisingly, a ballet company wasn't exactly what the troops were hoping to see. And quite often, they would get up and bang their seats noisily as they walked out of the theater. Well, we didn't care at all. We were so happy to be dancing again, and what did it matter? In any case, very soon, we were back again dancing in real theaters in the cities. In the theaters, in front of the conductor, and just in front of the footlights there, there would be a sign. And it would light up saying, Air Raid Alert, so all the public could see it. And then after time, it would say, All Clear. Well, in the intervening period, one would sometimes hear the bombers, the German bombers coming overhead, and a bomb 
would drop vroom somewhere or other like that. And when you finished your dance and ran off the stage, you said, where did it fall? What did it hit? And if it was in London, they might say one of the famous Wren churches or something like that had been hit. But the very curious thing is that I never heard of anybody being seen getting up and leaving the theater because there was an air raid on. They sat there, watched the performance. We continued. Everything went on as usual. And uh, people thought that was quite normal. One of the favorite ballets, which we must have danced, I should think, at least three times a week for five years, was Frederick Ashton's Facade. in Europe was over in 1945 and the following year it was decided that the Royal Opera House in London should have its own opera and ballet companies for the first time in its history. The little Sadler's Wells Ballet moved over to the big opera house and this was of course a big advance in the fortunes of our company. I was really very nervous because this was a very big stage and I rarely, almost never danced on a stage that size. And I was worried about whether I would be able to project into this big auditorium. It was this magnificent new production of The Sleeping Beauty designed by Oliver Messel, which opened the first season there. It was really beautiful. The colors and everything was so wonderful. And uh, this opening night of the beautiful opera house all done up. And the entire royal family were watching the performance. It was really a, a lovely occasion. Now, it was the same really magnificent production that brought us absolutely unimaginable success when we danced for the first time in America in October 1949 at the old Metropolitan Opera House in New York. And that certainly was an occasion never to be forgotten. I remember the first night in New York. I went to see her dressing room, in her dressing room, and it was the first time I'd seen her at all nervous. And I said, now, you mustn't be nervous. This is very important. And she said, I'm not nervous for me. I'm nervous for the reputation of the British Ballet. And I watched her make her first entrance, and I've never heard such applause in my life. It was like a gun, a huge gun. And she came to the famous Rosa Daggio, where the princess balances on the hand of all the princes. And when she came to the third prince, she'd caught such a miraculous balance that she didn't even take his hand. She just smiled at him. Well, I thought the audience would explode.
from the moment she came on stage, everybody was just in love. Because apart from her greatness as a dancer, her musicality, her, her dramatic sense, there was just her unbelievable lovability. Everybody loved her from the moment she appeared from behind the colonnades in Act One, Sleeping Beauty, through her final curtain calls, no matter what she was dancing. She was just overwhelming. In fact, I have to confess, and I never actually told this to Margot years later when we became friends, she is the only performer in my 40-odd years of going to various kinds of plays, operas, ballets, etc., whom I ever stood outside on the street, outside of a stage door, just to catch a sight of. I mean, it would never have occurred to me to intrude upon her for her autograph, but just to look at her in real life after the thrill of seeing her on stage was something I had to do. New York for me is always a city of beauty and excitement. And over the years, the city has brought me great happiness and great success. During that first visit, I was still totally unsophisticated and shy. Somehow I just couldn't believe that I could have become a big star overnight. It seemed so strange the magazines Time and Newsweek uh, both came out in editions with my picture on the cover. I thought that was something that only happened to heads of state or something. I was simply dumbfounded by it. And so gradually I came to accept that I was somebody. And yet it's funny to think that um, I was already 30 years old but I still had no real sense of my identity unless I was in the ballet on the stage, leaving the stage door or whatever. As long as it was ballet, I knew who I was. It was on our third New York season that I was sitting in my dressing room, putting on my makeup for the Sleeping Beauty again, and the stage doorman knocked at the door, he came in, and he said, a gentleman just left his card for you, Dr. Roberto E. Arias, ambassador for Panama to the United Nations. Suddenly there was a knock on the door, and in came Tito with a friend. And uh, he sat down on the settee, as usual, not saying anything very much, he just sort of stared at me. He left saying he would telephone me the next morning. Well, he did indeed telephone the next morning, it was rather early. He said, um, in his sort of quiet, mumbling way, he said, I'm afraid I have to go back to Panama unexpectedly. My plane leaves at midday, so order me some breakfast, and I'm coming round in uh, 20 minutes. Well, that threw me off a bit, because I wasn't used to waking up early in the morning anyway. But I ordered the breakfast, of course, and around came Tito. And he sat cross-legged on the floor of my room, as he used to do when I was in my dressing room in Cambridge. And uh, it transpired that, of course, um, he was married and he had three children. So we gossiped little about this and that and old days and people he knew in Cambridge. And uh, suddenly he said, uh, you know you're going to marry me and be very happy. I was sort of puzzled by this whole thing of Tito because it was very hard for me to recognize in this rather fat person uh, the Tito that I had known as a very slim boy in Cambridge. But he would keep appearing in all the cities where we were dancing. Suddenly he'd turn up in Philadelphia, then he'd turn up in Boston or something rather like this. We were married in Paris in February 1955 at the Panamanian consulate. Now, the office was extremely small. And, in fact, we hadn't invited close, even some close friends. But when I got there, the room was packed with people and uh, masses and masses of uh, cameras and movie cameras and everything were lined up in a huge battery behind the Consul General, Max Ertemat, who was marrying us. And my parents even couldn't get near to us. It was an awful mess. But afterwards, we had a beautiful reception and we went off for a honeymoon in the Bahamas. When we got back to London, two weeks later, um, Tito became Panama's ambassador to the court of St. James. So suddenly there I was with an embassy instead of a little flat I'd been living in before, with all these diplomatic duties, and at the same time trying to get to my classes and my rehearsals and do the performances, and then we would entertain at supper after the performance. 
And it was really difficult, but uh, wonderful. And for the first time in my life, I knew who I was. Tito specialized in marine law. One of his clients was Aristotle Onassis, and that meant that we frequently were entertained on Onassis' yacht, the Christina. I took this film myself. The most memorable occasion was a cruise with Sir Winston and Lady Churchill on board. And uh, to be close to these two great, great people was just so thrilling. Onassis was very fond of his daughter, Christina. Maria Callas was on the yacht with us. Onassis was always in a very good humor. He was a wonderful host. It was about two years after we were married that Tito started talking about the revolution he wanted to make in Panama. It seemed that there were certain changes that he felt his country really needed. Anyway, um, of course, he had to resign as ambassador before he went off down to Panama. And it happened that I was on a um, longish Australian tour. And when it finished, it was my holiday from the valley. Tito telephoned and said, uh, please meet me at the yacht club in the canal zone. So I waited at the pier, and after a while, very calmly strolling down, came Tito. And we boarded a little launch called the Nola. And we went out to sea. And this was the beginning of five sort of absolutely idyllic days when we were just sailing around these islands. But it was also interspersed with meeting up with a shrimp boat. I'm glad now that I had my camera with me to remind me of those strange days. Somehow or other, um, some of the arms had arrived in Panama in the false bottom of a little dinghy. And this dinghy was being towed when, due to the weight of the arms, it sank. Now, it sank in shark-infested waters, and everybody's in a bit of a tizzy, until a splendid captain we had said, oh, I don't mind sharks at all, and he dived in, and he got the thing up, and they broke open the bottom on this shrimp boat, and they unpacked all these guns and ammunitions and things which were stacked all around on the deck. But there was one morning when the shrimp boat and our little launch were together in a tiny cove on one of these islands. And very early, a plane circled round. Well, that was the police plane, and they had discovered us. And I said, what'll happen if you come back to Panama? So he said, I'll be arrested. And uh, Tito clambered aboard the shrimp boat. And in what seemed no time at all, there, this little thing was a speck in the distance. He'd said he would try to get to Costa Rica, which is the next country to Panama. But uh, we were to go back to Panama. Tito had said, please go slowly as a decoy, so they won't know which ship of the two he would be in. And what was unnerving was that for a lot of the time, there was one of these planes was circling around up in the sky watching us, and I found that very discomforting. Anyway, finally, we got back, sort of towards evening, to the yacht club, and I stepped out onto the pier. Not a soul in sight, nobody waiting to arrest me, and everything was fine. But later that night, I went, of course, to the family, and then I was staying with some friends, and later that night, uh, I was woken up. I'd just gone to bed, actually. And the hostess came and knocked on the door and said, I'm terribly sorry, she was in tears. Uh, I'm afraid you have to get up. They want to take you, police want to take you for questioning. So I got up and there I got into the car with Max Ertemat, who two years before had been the consul general in Paris and had married us. And he was frightfully upset because he had to take me to the police station and this great big door opened and I went in and the door clanged behind me and then I was there waiting for questioning. So they took me to what seemed to me like a sort of VIP cell. It was upstairs on the first floor or something. It had a little private bathroom on the side and there was a bed and on the bedside table was a bowl with some roses in it. And this lieutenant said, oh, the governor of the jail put the roses. He grows them himself and he ordered them to be put in your room. So everything was very nice, except he locked the door when he went out. Finally, they did ask me these questions. I said as little as I could about who any of the other people were. 
And then they took me a bit later into a car, straight from jail into a car, and out I was deported with a ticket to Miami, and there I was. From Miami, I took a plane to New York, and when I arrived there, it was the most incredible thing. All these press were at the bottom of the steps down from the plane. Tremendous horde of people and cameras and everything. And when I stepped out and went down, I thought, well, I really ought to enjoy this. I mean, how many times has it happened to an ordinary citizen? Fine, if you're a head of state or something like this, but this is never going to happen to me again. So I sort of went down the steps. And they had a press conference in the airport. What are you trying to get me to say exactly? Why don't you <laughs> tell me what it is you want me to say? <laughs> and I'll tell you if I say it or not. Because you're fishing around something and I can't quite get the gist of it. Yes, yes, it's what gave rise to all these reports. I presume that something has happened in Panama in the last 10 days. You were in jail, Dame Margaret. Among, among other things, I was in jail. Did and you carry about a gun? all those things, I am not going to say anything. And then one afternoon, a friend from one of the press agencies telephoned to say he just had heard that Tito had taken asylum in the Brazilian embassy in Panama. So that was a tremendous relief. Oh. And uh, it was uh, about four weeks later that he was allowed to travel down to Brazil. And of course, I rushed down immediately. We were reunited at the airport in Rio de Janeiro. After a couple of weeks holiday, we went back to London, where I was to prepare for the next ballet season. And that season brought me my favorite of all roles in the ballet, Ondine. It was a three-act ballet uh, by Frederick Ashton, and my role was that of a water nymph. It fitted me like a glove. I loved her in Ondine because somehow it seemed to be a full role which she finally created herself. I mean, it wasn't like the... the like the scene which is a role taken on after hundreds of people have done it. This was absolutely her creation. I mean, she was particularly marvellous in when she comes to life and she sort of sees her shadow for the first time. Oh, that was incredibly indicated and, and, and completely convincing, which she had this extraordinary quality of being.
1961, our company went to dance in Russia as part of an exchange visit between the Kirov Ballet from Leningrad. And uh, we arrived there. The Kirov Theater used to be the famous Mariinsky Imperial Theater. So when I came to dance The Sleeping Beauty on that hallowed stage, I was so frightened, I was so nervous, and there would be all these old Russian dancers and teachers and people in the audience. And I'm always terribly self-conscious when I know that there's somebody very distinguished in my profession sitting watching me. I, suddenly I have two left feet and steps that I can always do perfectly fail. It's just terrible. So I'm afraid that I dance pretty badly in The Sleeping Beauty, at least it seems so to me. But very fortunately, I had in the repertoire Ondine, and this new ballet they absolutely loved, and so that kind of restored my confidence a bit. But generally, I would say in, in Leningrad and in Moscow, where we again did The Sleeping Beauty, I, I don't think that I danced my best on that Russian tour, which I'm sorry, it was the only time I've ever danced in Russia. While we were in Leningrad, the rumors came that one of the Kirov Ballet's best dancers had defected as he was going to arrive in London for their season at the Opera House. Uh, it was all very quiet and sort of hush-hush. But when we got back to London, we learned that uh, he was indeed one of the young, most brilliant dancers that they had. His name was Rudolf Nureyev, and he was 23 years old, and by then dancing with a company in Paris. Now, Michael Soames, with whom I had been dancing for the last 10 years, ever since Robert Heltman had left the company, uh, had decided to retire after the Russian visit. A lot of people thought, even if they didn't say so, that at 42, it would be quite a good idea if I did the same. And probably I would have done, if it hadn't been that Ninette de Valois invited Nureyev to dance Giselle at the Opera House uh, a few months later, in February, I think it would have been, 1962. And then she said to me one day, well, Nureyev is going to dance Giselle, would you like to dance it with him? She offered it to me first, as it were. I immediately thought, he's 23, I'm 42, that's going to be like mutton dancing with lamb, and I thought it was pretty awful, so I said, well, I, I would like to think about it. And I did think about it, and I suddenly thought, well, he's going to be the big sensation all this season. I'm, if I don't dance with him, I will be absolutely a back number, nothing, because everybody will rush to the Nureyev performances, and somebody else will be dancing them with him. So I took my courage in both hands. And I said, yes, I'll do Giselle with Nureyev.
in retrospect, I believe that our partnership wouldn't have been such a great success were it not for the difference in our ages. Because what happened was that I would go out on the stage thinking, who is going to look at me with this young lion leaping 10 feet high in the air and doing all these fantastic things? And then Rudolph had um, really a deep respect because I was this older, very famous, established ballerina. And he felt a bit, well, when I'm on the stage behind, beside her, who's going to look at me? So it sort of charged the performance that we were both going out there, inspired, egged on, as it were, by the other one, and also with absolutely the same objective about what this performance should produce. And somehow, uh, it just worked. After the first two rehearsals of Giselle, Margot started to trust me. And things went very smooth. And uh, every rehearsal, uh, it was like a performance. I, I remember Cordoba people crying during rehearsal, uh, tears running down their cheeks. Those performances of Giselle, they became a historic event. Uh, then Margot asked me to do Swan Lake with her. I flew in from Denmark, and uh, I sat in Madam's box. And I watched first act, and I suddenly see extraordinary thing. There's a, uh, in the first act, when uh, Prince meets Odette, uh, they have a mime. They start gesticulating. I, did, I wasn't trained like that in Russia. It, it was a great shock to me. And uh, I came to her, and, and I said, well, he was so beautiful, and that he did mime so well, but I couldn't find place for myself. I can't do that performance. I'll destroy it. She said, just you try. Then, however, I agreed to dance with her, Swan Lake. I couldn't refuse. And we started to work, and it uh, wasn't as smooth as Giselle. Uh, we had a lot of arguments and differences. And uh, uh, suddenly she told me at one moment that uh, her first Swan Lake was 1938. That was my birthday. Uh, so I started to laugh. And, however, we worked out it. Uh, version and when we went on stage all differences all arguments were forgotten we become one body one soul we moved in one way where it was very complementary every arm movement of every head movement uh, there were no more uh, cultural gaps uh, age difference uh, we've been absorbed in characterization became the part and uh, public was enthralled I think only because we were enthralled with each other and with what we did with the role first thing she taught me it was great professionalism she had the way she worked her work is very thorough Get out, do it, do it well, and have a good time. Don't linger. Get on with it. It was very lucky for us uh, to have those glorious years. She became a very, very great friend of mine. She, she, to me, she is a part of my family. That's all what I have, only her. <laughs> In 1964, Tito's and my life changed dramatically. I had no idea until I reached his bedside 
of the terrible gravity of the situation. The doctor said that a bullet had uh, lodged against his spine and they couldn't be sure whether this might cause paralysis. So I was by his bedside as much as I could possibly be. And after three days, when the doctor was making an examination of him, I saw that he shook his head. And I thought, well, that it seems is bad news. Um, of course, at that point, uh, all the doctors, people in the hospital knew that most likely this spinal injury would be for life and he would be paralyzed. That was something that I, I suppose, wasn't prepared, an idea that I wasn't prepared to accept in my mind at that time. So I just uh, didn't really believe it. In fact, for months I didn't believe it until I was able to face the idea. But uh, as soon as possible, the doctors in Panama thought it best to send him to the best rehabilitation hospital, which is in England at Stoke Mandeville. So he was sent on the plane with a doctor and a nurse and all kinds of people with him. And he arrived at Stoke Mandeville and clearly they were going to look after him exceedingly well there. So I felt reassured by that. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to cancel all my engagements. It wasn't a time that I could suddenly just cut everything. And I had to leave two days after his arrival. I had to leave for the Spoleto Festival in Italy. And uh, so I went off heavy-hearted with my mother. And after we'd been in Spoleto two days, uh, early in the morning, there was a telephone call from the hospital for me to return immediately. Well, of course, my heart sank completely. But still, arrived back in London at the airport. Our chauffeur was there to meet us. And I said, how is it? How is it? He said, well, the last radio bulletin said he's still alive. <laughs> but he was in a coma. <laughs> so silly to cry, but I'm really still so affected by it. So when I got there, he was in a coma. And um, he remained in a coma for three days. And we were watching, watching. The doctors hadn't any idea how he would be if he came out of it, because they said that he had had a temperature of 108, which doesn't exist on the thermometer. And so they had never seen somebody survive this. They didn't know how he might come out of it, but obviously they expected that his brain would be affected. So slowly, slowly, he came back to consciousness. He, but his speech also was affected, and it was very difficult to understand. The doctor said, does he appear to be as he was before? I said, well, yes, I think so. And extraordinary miracle of miracles, although he was paralyzed and couldn't speak, uh, very little, only with a whisper, his brain returned completely brilliant, as it always was, his memory and everything. And uh, that is the, finally, that is the most important thing about a person. It's their brain, and, uh, and uh, there was Tito, in a way, not changed at all. Miss Bromley was the chief physiotherapist and head of rehabilitation department when Tito arrived at Stoke Mandeville and he stayed there for two years so she really saw his condition at that time. When such a patient with great disabilities returns home the family has to make many adjustments. For example someone has to get up every night and turn the patient once at least and maybe two or three times. But it concentration has to gradually turn from disability to ability and the fact that Tito after nearly 25 years is so fit able to manage his farm and travel all over the world is largely due I'm sure to his own indomitable spirit and Margot's constant care Tito had been shot at the end of an election campaign, and as anyone in politics knows very well, campaigns clean everybody right out of money, so that obviously wasn't a time when I could even consider dropping my career. Um, he had been in the hospital continuously. In the ballet, Kenneth Macmillan choreographed Romeo and Juliet, in which I was to dance, and this was yet another of the great choreographers that I had a chance to work with. 
It was wonderful, really, because by that time we were able to persuade the doctors to let Tito go by ambulance up to the Royal Opera House and to watch the performance. And uh, you can just imagine my emotion when I was dancing there in this first performance and Tito was sitting in his wheelchair in the box watching. for a variety of different reasons it turned out that I went on dancing for quite a number of years and all this time I was very conscious that once I would drop the most difficult ballet from my repertoire uh, my stamina level would drop accordingly and then the next ballet so it would go all the way down the line uh, so I was very anxious to keep dancing the difficult things as long as I could 
And the ballet that I had always found very, very exacting, the most exacting, uh, tiring and difficult altogether. In fact, the only ballet, three-act ballet, that I had never felt able, if necessary, to dance twice in the same day. And that was Swan Lake.
On my 60th birthday, there was a gala at the Royal Opera House to celebrate my retirement. For this, Frederick Ashton choreographed especially a little dance that was still within my powers, and he himself joined me on the stage in the last few bars of the music, and we walked off together, arm in arm. That was the first and last performance of that dance. It was called Salut d'Amour. Kiss from Frederick Ashton, the greatest choreographer of our time. My dancing days were over. It was natural to expect that the big spectacular events in my life were also at an end. And out of the blue came an invitation to be Chancellor of the University of Durham in England. The installation, my installation, took place in Durham Cathedral, one of the most beautiful in England. And as I made my entry at the head of my procession, which was the last of four processions, Trumpets played a fanfare written specially in my honor. By the authority of the university, I confer on you the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa. Tito had always wanted a cattle farm. And now that at last I was free to live with him, we bought this farm in Panama. And here we built our own little house. <laughs> this is the one I was saying. Oh, there are two there. Is this one of our own um, home produce, this one? 
Yeah. Bread here. That's a symbol, for sure. That one. With the white face. This little baby one with the white face and the white eyelashes. It's a question of weeding out. Hmm. Yes, to get to finally to get a very high quality of mother. Emma. That's the story of my life, so far. And I can't help thinking that when that little girl walked a few hundred yards to her first dancing class, she couldn't have imagined on what a long, long journey she was embarking. <laughs>